Welcome everyone. We will get started in just a few minutes. Welcome to the ONC Tech Forum Clinical Decision Support Series Session Number One, What to Know About Clinical Decision Support Through Real-World Examples. My name is Kiara Matrosino with Kaufman & Associates and will be assisting with the logistical support for this Zoom session. To ask questions, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you have general comments, please, please click the chat button also at the bottom of your screen. This will pull up a chat box, which will open to the right side of your Zoom interface. Additionally, we ask that you select the speaker view option located at the top right side of your Zoom interface. This will allow you to see the speaker as they present or share information. If you need technical assistance during the session, please type the issue into the chat box and one of our techs will respond to you. Finally, please be aware that today's session is being recorded. Closed captioning is available by by clicking the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. I will now turn it over to Allison Kemp. Hi, and thank you for joining the ONC Tech Forum Clinical Decision Support Series Session 1 called What to Know About Clinical Decision Support Through Real, Real World Examples. I'm Allison Kemp, the lead organizer for this workshop series at ONC. And just a reminder to everyone, the recording of this presentation and slides will be available on ONC's website after the event. Next slide, please. Our second session in this series is the Future of Clinical Decision Support on Wednesday, September 27th. And our third session is Creating Value by Modernizing and Measuring Clinical Decision Support on Wednesday, November 8th. Registration for both opens on Monday, June 19th. Next slide, please. Today's session will include an overview of CDS by ONC's Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Tom Mason, followed by Dr. Bill Russell from Conviva Care Centers, who will speak about implementing CDS locally, followed by questions and a break. And then we will have presentations about three examples of interoperable CDS in the real world from Buck Rogers at Medical University of South Carolina, 
Dr. Lydia Drumwright from the University of Washington, and Dr. Patrick O'Connor and Deepa Apana from Health Partners Institute, followed by a second time for questions. And now we will get started with Dr. Mason's presentation. Thanks so much, Allison. Uh, can you see me okay? All right, great. Let's see here. So first of all, I want to thank you for joining the first Tech Forum wor workshop in our series focused on clinical decision support. Um, I want to thank the ONC team that's been coordinating this workshop, as well as those attending today and our presenters. Uh, I'm going to be giving uh, a, providing a general overview of clinical decision support focused on definition, benefits, challenges and limitations, trends, and also um, queue up today's case studies. Uh, next slide, please. So the definition, um, clinical decision support provides clinicians, staff, patients, or other individuals with knowledge and person-specific information intelligently filtered or presented at appropriate times to enhance health and care. CDS encompasses a variety of tools to enhance decision-making in the clinical workflow. Much like in-person peer learning, for example, grand rounds with residents and attendings, CDS should serve as a tool to help clinicians on the front line think through options at the point of care. Key components and stakeholders that support a typical CDS system include data integration by technology developers, a knowledge base established by clinicians, researchers, professional societies, and the user interface leveraged by clinicians or patients. Clinical decision support types include a variety of tools and interventions, computerized as well as non-computerized. Um, non-computerized tools include clinical practice guidelines. Uh, these types of guidelines can then be converted into a digital format to provide clinical decision support resources online, for example, um, as well, Clinical decision support tools can be used on a variety of platforms, such as electronic health records, personal computers, handheld devices, um, and helpful guideline-based CDS includes, for example, the incorporation of immunization schedules or opioid prescribing guidelines within an electronic health records workflow, just to name a few. Um, computerized physician order entry, or CPOE, um, this system has enabled physicians to prescribe medications using electronic entry, and the combination of CPOE and clinical decision support can help physicians choose the right drug in the right dose and alert physicians prescribing if, for example, a patient is allergic to a medication or if there's a potential drug-drug interaction. CDS is not simply an alert, a notification, or an explicit care suggestion. It encompasses a variety of tools, including but not limited to computerized alerts and reminders for patients and providers, condition-specific order sets, contextually relevant reference information, documentation templates, which I'll talk a little bit more about, diagnostic support, as well as focused uh, patient data reports and summary. I am an internal medicine uh, primary care physician, um, prior to joining ONC, I worked in Chicago at the Cook County Health and Hospital System, uh, where I was also the ambulatory CMIO and lead physician for the electronic health record um, rollout to all of the ambulatory clinics um, serving uh, three hospitals and the entire uh, Cook County. Um, one of my responsibilities was to um, implement and develop the documentation templates that the, not only the primary care physicians, but the entire um, suite of ambulatory clinicians um, at uh, the hospital system. And so one of the things I did um, was to reach out to the doctors and that would be using the new EHR and ask them about what were the things that were important for them as they capture information um, through the electronic health record. And I worked with our developer to develop a clinical decision support tool that was focused on the progress note, where 
when a, let's say the primary care progress note, um, when the physician opened the note, based on the patient's age, gender, and problems in their problem list, um, the system would auto-populate within the progress note the patient's preventive health maintenance expectations, such as their last mammogram, last colonoscopy, last pap smear, um, or if they were diabetic, their last hemoglobin A1C or microalbumin. And it would also prompt the clinician um, to let them know if any of these tests were overdue and have, allow them to easily um, place an order for any of those tests within the progress note. And so um, it was interesting after this went live, I literally had doctors coming up, hugging me in the hallway, um, saying how helpful this was to allow them to find information that was previously difficult to uh, locate within the EHR, right within their workflow, allowing them to easily take care of and focus on the patient's needs for, the, for that specific encounter. Um, so this is one example of when clinical decision support is implemented in a way to support a clinician's workflow that it can Im improve um, efficiency and quality. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a growing body of literature demonstrates the positive impact and benefits that clinical decision support can have on care processes and clinical outcomes. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, ARC, a close federal partner of ours and a leader in the field of clinical decision support research and programs, commissioned a literature review that found evidence showing CDS had a positive impact on process measures such as how reliably clinicians ordered necessary um, and evidence-based preventative and treatment services, very similar to the example I provided. Studies have also shown that well-executed clinical decision support can reduce adverse events from drug-drug interactions and medication errors. It can also decrease unnecessary laboratory testing and increase um, cardiovascular disease risk assessment in routine primary care practice. Um, available evidence shows that while there's significant room for improvement due to challenges that I'll discuss um, in a couple of slides, um, CDS in the right context, implemented properly with the right kind of management, can reduce errors, improve quality of care, reduce costs, and ease the cognitive burden on healthcare pro providers and clinicians using this type of technology. The five, the CDS five rights concept has been cited as a best practice framework that may be helpful when considering CDS options appropriate for a practice. Um, it states that when CDS is effectively designed, it provides the right information, for example, evidence-based guidelines to the right people, um, the care team, including the patient potentially, um, in the right formats, either um, for, uh, order sets, flow sheets, dashboards, patient lists, and through the right channels. And the example I've, we've given so far is the electronic health record, but also patient portals, mobile devices, um, and at the right time within the workflow. Next slide, please. So a few of the key challenges. Um, a central promise of health information technology is its potential to help address the burden of exponentially expanding clinical knowledge, patient care data, and choice complexity on the finite amount of time that clinicians, patients, and other members of the care team have. Uh, in addition to electronic health record data, data from clinical research, disease registries, patient surveys, and information ex exchanges is expanding. Uh, the National Academy of Medicine, as a part of their learning health system series, convene subject matter experts in the field of CDS to be a part of an optimizing strategies for clinical decision support series. A few key challenges identified by the group included uh, the various uh, pathways for implementing CDS within different healthcare organizations, lack of reliable, shareable CDS content and capabilities that can easily be adopted across healthcare organizations and health IT systems, um, technical difficulties of sharing CDS across institutions, uh, suboptimal user interfaces, um, the uh, multitude of implementation choices, and workflows that result in many clinicians viewing CDS as more of a nuisance from issues such as alert fatigue 
than as a helpful tool. And I really like to think of these challenges in terms of their potential for opportunities for improvement, um, which include um, increased engagement of stakeholders in the design, implementation, and use of CDS, the incorporation of new knowledge, including patient reported outcomes and the contextualization of information into CDS, um, strengthening the CDS implementation evidence base. And I have to acknowledge that there's a significant amount of work being done in these areas. Uh, you'll hear um, through the workshop series work being done by our panelists. There's work being done here at ONC, our colleagues at AHRQ and CDC, as well as other federal partners are actively um, addressing and working on uh, solutions um, for these challenges um, that we're, I'm looking forward to hearing more about through the course of the workshop series. Uh, next slide, please. Current trends. Um, there's a number of emerging trends and technologies shaping the future of CDS, such as artificial intelligence, natural language processing, and mobile applications. Uh, we continue to see clinical decision support integration within electronic health records, allowing for real-time access to patient data, improving accuracy and relevance of decision support. With the proliferation of mobile devices and wearables, CDS will extend beyond traditional healthcare settings. Patients will have access to CDS tools and guidance on their smartphones, wearables, and other connected devices enabling continuous monitoring, health management, and timely interventions. CDS will also play a critical role in advancing precision medicine initiatives by integrating genomic data, phenotypic information, and clinical knowledge. CDS systems can provide tailored treatment recommendations, drug gene interaction alerts, and assist in matching patients with targeted therapies. There's a growing emphasis on involving patients in the decision-making process. Um, in the future, CDS systems will empower patients by providing them with personalized information, treatment options, and risk assessments, allowing for improved shared decision-making between patients and healthcare providers. And as I mentioned, there's a number of initiatives and projects already underway that are focusing on many of these areas, but this, um, these types of technologies and direction for CDS is what we see uh, in the near future. One other uh, thing I'd like to mention is that we recently published our health data technology and interoperability proposed rule, which has proposed requirements for decision support interventions and predictive models to support algorithmic transparency. Uh, just to give you a bit of background, I think I have enough time here, um, that the High Tech Act uh, of 2009 required in law that certified electronic health record technology include the capability to have decision support as a part of what was called the qualified EHR definition. It's been a part of our certification program from the very beginning, um, but what's changed over the past 10 years plus is the substantial adoption of health IT and electronic health records across the country and the evolution of computational technologies that can be applied to digital health data. So now we have this large digital foundation of data through electronic health records and other means. Uh, today um, at ONC, through our work on, on the Cures Act, are working on making interoperability easier through initiatives like the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement. And we're also seeing new AI techniques that are entering the market almost daily. Um, so in response to these changes, we've collaborated with federal partners, including ARC, FDA, um, the HHS Office of Civil Rights, the VA, uh, and the FTC on our new rule, which proposes new policies that if finalized, would promote greater trust in predictive support interventions used in healthcare um, and help enable users to determine whether, whether predictive interventions are fair, appropriate, valid, effective, and safe, as well as enable market competition. The existing scope and structure of our certification program is fit to enhance transparency around decision, predictive decision support. 
Um, the program has existing requirements to make transparent information regarding the authorship, bibli bibliographic, and other kinds of source attribute information for evidence-based decision support linked to referential interventions. I encourage you to comment on our proposed rule. Comments are due on June 30th. Um, and um, as you see here, you can find out more information on our proposed rule. Um, and um, there's just a, I just wanna conclude by saying there, these are just a few areas driving the future of clinical decision support. And as technology continues to advance and healthcare uh, needs to evolve, we can expect further innovations and enhancements to clinical, clinical decision support systems, ultimately leading to improved patient outcomes, reduced costs, and more efficiency in healthcare delivery. Um, next slide, please. So today's case studies, this workshop series will provide examples of successful CDS implementation and their impact on patient care and outcomes. Uh, today's examples are from the Medical University of South Carolina's CDC Clinical Practice Guideline for Prescribing Opioids Recommendations Pilot. Um, also, we'll have the University of Washington's Clinical Opioid Summary with Prescription Integration Tool and Pain Tracker, um, as well as Health Partner Institute's Priority Wizard Tool. And I think at this point, I will pass it back to Allison. Thank you so much, Dr. Mason, for that excellent overview of CDS. And our next presenter today will be Dr. Bill Russell from Conviva Care Centers, and he will be presenting about implementing CDS locally. It's over to you, Dr. Russell. Thanks, Allison. <clears throat> Thank you. And Dr. Mason, great, great lead in here. Um, so as Dr. Mason describes, this is CDSS is really you know, goal directed at improving quality, at protecting patient safety, at increasing provider efficiency, and hopefully increasing effectiveness as well. Effectiveness is sometimes defined by the business, right? Effectiveness can be a few extra bucks on a on an EM code or you know, maybe a, a few extra, you know, diagnosis codes in a in a in a RAF score. But I like to think about a CDSS in terms of our care model. We are value-based, senior-focused, primary care, ambulatory care, <clears throat> complex seniors. So there's a tremendous amount of information for our, our providers to process um, about their patients. And they're, and they're processing that information, not just um, you know, during an office visit, and, and that's critical, but also in between office visits, you know, in a, a process we call panel management. So supporting the data inflows and doing some of the calculations and optimizing the health outcomes, both the reportable outcomes, you know, like HEDIS measures and other things, and the patient outcomes, which are the things that matter the most, right? Keeping people well, healthy, um, healing, functional is really critical. And technology is at the foundation of our path to being an age-friendly learning health system. So both paradigms, age-friendly as well as, as learning. So, so in order to get on that flywheel of, of being a learning health system, you really need to have CDS tools embedded in your workflows and your workflows triggered by CDS tools in a, in a kind of a flywheel plan, do, study, act, um, you know, sort of way. So, so what are the keys to successful implementations? And you're gonna see Dr. Mason teed up the three um, great examples that'll follow, um, but you're gonna see in each of these things that in order to be successful to implement uh, decision support tools, <clears throat> you have to keep in mind, number one, providers, especially physicians, want systems to think with them and not for them. They really have learned, trained, succeeded by being really smart and by being able to individualize care to the, to the patient and the context of care that that person is with. And CDS tools don't yet have the power to build all that contextual 
um, you know, you know, framework around the outcome that's being, you know, driven toward. <clears throat> and so physicians need to know that the CDS tools are going to be accelerators, what I like to say, wind at their back, and not barriers, blocks, or necessarily alerts. Now, mistake proofing is critical. Doctors will make a ton of mistakes. We've learned from a patient safety perspective that checklists are enormously important. And so automating those patient safety and, and checklist tools are critical, but I, you know, most of the time the providers don't really see that as, as, as headwind. They understand you know, that these are patient safety tools. But when you get to quality, and especially in a complex po patient population, those definitions of quality are really critical um, in order to get the buy-in you need you know, from the providers. So, so governance, really critical. How, who decides the rules that become automated? Where is the guidance coming from? And you know, people would say, well, AHRQ or HEDIS or other uh, expert panels are the sources of truth. And to some extent that's true. Um, we've automated a number of um, American Geriatric Society uh, guidelines. We've automated some AHRQ guidelines. We've obviously automated essentially all the HEDIS uh, metrics. And they're all machine specified, very easy to automate. Well, at least the, the HEDIS, HEDIS ones are. Um, but you know, how you do the math is really critical. Um, and, and who prioritizes what measures really bubble to the top uh, during the precious time of an encounter and how many things can be fulfilled in between encounters. So governance is, is, is key. Um, the other thing is you, you have to have goals. Um, it's easy to kind of go into this business and say, we're going to achieve, you know, higher safety or, or, or better quality as measured by, you know, some external agency like HEDIS or, or Five Star. Um, your organization has to define goals for their CDSS implementation. They have to define the key results. What are the, what are the, what, what are the needles that will move and how far will they move? Um, you have to execute. I think Dr. Mason suggested this, you know, doing the math correctly is really critical. If you present bad, if you present bad uh, recommendations or if you have big gaps in your data so that, um, you know, the CDS alert is really a, a data gap, but not really a, a true care gap, uh, your, your providers are going to get very frustrated. So um, execution is critical, both in terms of structuring the queries in terms of aligning them with the workflows, um, but also in terms of data acquisition. And, and so in our, in our company, in our case, um, we're the benefactors of some tremendous work that's gone before us. I think you know, the best example I can give is the uh, Massachusetts Interact program uh, where, um, you know, where transitions of care and patient handoffs and clinical summaries were specified by the receivers of care and, and built by the senders. And, um, and those kinds of um, aligned workflow, um, aligned expectations um, and fulfilling the needs of the receivers was really critical in that, in that instance. So, so decision support tools also require training. It's really easy to think that folks are gonna use their CDSS the same way they use their iPhone out of the box and everything will be intuitive. Um, that's not something that's easy for the docs. And so if they don't understand um, the calculations, if they don't understand the potential sources of error, um, if they don't understand the conditional logic, and I think Dr. Mason really talked about the importance of using conditional logic in your CDSS tools, especially templates, um, they're gonna, they're gonna, it's gonna slow them down. Um, there'll be some resistance and some pushback, and it doesn't help anybody to, to find that. So, you know, the training is really critical. And then, as I mentioned earlier, CDSS has to be part of a larger organizational goal toward being as good as you can be, process improvement, quality improvement, quality assurance, however your organization defines it, set some targets and some goals. Um, aspire to be as good as you can be and use your CDSS tools to, um, to, to, to achieve those goals. 
So they're not an end of themselves. They're a means to an end in, in, in sort of every kind of way. All right. So um, let me just give you a couple of examples from a value-based uh, senior-focused primary care to kind of prove the point about implementation, right? So in value-based care, um, our, our providers are accountable for health outcomes for their patients um, continuously. So if a patient falls and breaks their hip and you know, goes to the emergency room, um, that outcome is really um, held uh, you know, to, to the primary care providers, um, you know, I, I would say we ding them, right? Right. That's, we expect, we, 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 we strive for perfection, knowing we will fail, but hoping that in the pursuit of perfection, we will achieve excellence, right? So, so this continuous responsibility and accountability um, relies heavily upon data acquisition. And, and Dr. Mason talked about the health ecosystem and the standards and the interoperability. We are trying to acquire data about patients all the time, analyze patient data all the time, and then try to bring those things back to the doctors in real time so that they can manage not just their schedule, but their entire panel. So we use a huddle report for the patients who are coming in and look at all the gaps and barriers that are identified and try to mitigate those. It's a team-based approach. So the huddle report works through uh, medical assistants, center administrators, and others, not just the providers. Um, but, but, the, uh, but the huddle report is a really good example of a decision support tool that helps um, the patients coming in that day. But we also use some population health tools to allow um, patients to be um, managed more effectively. So just unengaged patients um, and looking at people who um, haven't, uh, don't have a follow-up appointment or have never made their first visit and getting those people in and then leveraging additional data sources for people that are hard to engage or people who are resistive to, to care. Um, and also using some uh, de-prescribing uh, strategies, again, leveraging American Geriatric Society guidelines, we're a senior focused primary care, our average patient is 77, they take on average seven to eight medications, they have five to seven chronic conditions. It's a sick, complex population. But we still use our analytics tools uh, to identify some opportunities for deep prescribing, but we don't deep prescribe on an individualized basis. We we de-prescribe based on algorithms that are specified by our pharmacy and therapeutics committee. And again, those are informed by uh, national standards and expert recommendations. Um, we use care triggers. Uh, we've automated something called the start and stop. Start is drugs that people probably need based on their problem list, but aren't on the regimen. Stop is a much bigger group of medications, things that people are on that need to, need to be discontinued or de-prescribed. Uh, we also look at potentially toxic prescribing, not just in terms of drug number, but in the combinations of drugs and other things that really require a machine calculation to identify. And we've triggered a number of process improvement uh, programs around this. So implementation requires continuous engagement with your provider community, training, monitoring outcomes, plan, do, study, act. Okay. And then I think, you know, you know, Dr. Mason mentioned natural language processing, and we're pretty proud of some of that uh, the work we're doing. Again, acquiring uh, discharge records through the national framework and the national network, um, and then um, running those through national natural language processing to spot unsafe discharges. Unsafe discharges are really at the root of so many of the problems we see in senior senior focused uh, primary care. Unsafe discharges in terms of uh, repeated failures of the same strategy, unsafe receivers, inadequate caregivers, um, unsafe uh, care plans, compl overly complex or even dangerous. So we've used some of the same CDS tools for our primary care providers and applied those to hospitalists and SNFists and, and even the specialists to try to identify, hey, these are some, these are some records that contain um, alerts and triggers that we need to respond to very quickly. So, so that's been a very rewarding and successful thing. And it's, it's well accepted by the providers because 
they understand that we're, we're doing a lot of the calculations on their behalf. We're processing a ton of information that they couldn't do at the point of care. And they certainly couldn't do at scale with a panel of 400 or 500 patients. And yet we're doing that. We're delivering those information, those data sets to them at a time when they can act on them and, um, and giving them feedback on, on how they're doing. And we've also aligned you know, our incentive programs, not to productivity, uh, but to quality. And so these CDSS tools help, help our providers to achieve um, you know, their, their incentive programs. So those are the, those are the key, the key uh, elements of implementation, I think. And I think of all of the key elements, I think it's governance, alignment, and thinking uh, alongside your providers um, not on behalf of them, that's really critical to success. So anyway, Allison, I hope that was uh, timely enough to leave some time for questions. Thanks, Dr. Russell. That was very timely and we have lots of times for lots of times for questions now. So um, I see an old friend out there, Shelly Spiro in the in the chat. So I just want to give a shout out to Shelly and thanks for participating. So So if anyone has questions, feel free to put those in the chat or the Q&A, or if you were interested in, uh, in speaking, you can raise your hand and we can um, have you unmuted. So Allison, maybe I will uh, help a little bit here. Um, okay. There's 128 participants and folks are here because, right? Um, what are the big problem? What's one problem your organization is trying to solve using CDSS? And um, you know, maybe we can we can sort of break that down and say, you know, how would we how would we go after that? You know, that that problem um, or something along those lines. Because people are here for a reason, um, so. Yeah, I see. And it's a really good question. I think quickly, we can jump to that. But also, there's one one question in the uh, Q and A about the the regulatory needs associated with developing and releasing the solutions. Um, I think if they, if you have any comments on that or. Wow, that's a great question. And I kind of went through that pretty quickly when we talked about governance. But one of the things I learned mm -hmm. very early on, so having, you know, being an informaticist and a geriatrician and building solutions for complex seniors across multiple settings for, you know, 25 years, the very first lesson I learned is compliance needs to be at the table as you begin to write the specifications. Right, so um, you don't 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 pretend uh, you think or don't don't assume you understand um, the regulatory and policy requirements associated with the you know with the solution you're driving to. I think it's really important for payment, right? So we see a lot of decision support tools around evaluation and management coding, or we'll see tools around risk adjustment uh, coding. And whenever anything is going to influence payment, you need to have an absolutely impartial expert review panel um, sitting alongside with your development group, making sure that you are following in strict adherence to the guidance um, around, around, those, uh, around those measures. So, you know, so the examples would be you know, the diagnostic criteria for certain conditions. Um, your developers and even your physician experts may not be expert on, you know, certain chronic conditions. Um, it's easy when you have something like HEDIS, which, you know, has, has most of the specifications built in um, electronically and you can, you, can, you can do the calculations. It's a lot more complicated when, you, when you're doing um, things around risk adjustment 
Um, so you have to be super careful. Um, I think, you know, the other part of that is always get expert recommendations as a starting point. The uh, US Preventive Services Task Force, for example, fantastic. We love the American Geriatric Society. They have a ton of decision support tools, many of them on paper that you can then use as a springboard for your automation. Um, you know, obviously HRQ, fantastic. Um, but you're, you know, in your individual care organization, you're going to have a source of truth. Um, when we look at very old seniors, and I use that term lovingly, but when you look at people who are 90, 95, who are on seven or eight medications, you don't really have evidence for a lot of the things that really need to get done. And so that's why we've built, um, you know, an advisory board and some experts from the outside of the organization who help us to, 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 um, to build those to build those pathways and to automate those pathways and the decision support that kind of provide the guardrails around those pathways. So this was probably the most important question and I apologize for glossing over it, but, um, but yeah, you, you really need to have um, you know, compliance, a source of truth that is unassailable and, um, and, and unequivocal um, you know, connection between the decisions you're supporting and the outcomes you hope to achieve. If you don't have that, you're gonna not gonna have buy-in and you're gonna have trouble down the road, so. Great, thank you. There are a couple more questions. One, one question is about um, the FDA medical device regulation assessment, which um, I can just quickly note that FDA just released earlier this year guidance on their um, they're taking a risk-based approach that is complementary to what ONC has, particularly if you review um, what's in our proposed rule right now, you'll see it's a very different approach uh, because FDA is explicitly not regulating non-device CDS. They, they have a definition of when, C, when a system that provides diagnostics essentially trans, translates over into the device realm that is relevant but you have to refer to FDA's guidance on that, I'm afraid. I don't think we have anyone from FDA who, or any of our lawyers to really comment on that. But um, hopefully that's helpful to the uh, person who answered the question, asked the question. But the, another question um, from Shelley is about um, population bias with CDS for the aging population, especially related to AI and machine learning and the recommendation to use augmented intelligence related to what you're saying about the uh, SNF decision support. Yeah. So we're pretty setting agnostic, uh, Shelley. Um, and we use a paradigm to think about patients and we use this framework for essentially all of our process improvement, many of our assessments, a lot of our communication tool, but it's called 5Ms. And, um, and the S stands for social determinants. Um, the, the full five M's are, you know, what matters to patients, medications, mobility, mentation, multi-complexity, and the S is social determinants. Well, we use some external uh, indices, the SDI, and there's a great uh, program at the University of Wisconsin um, led by Dr. Amy Kind around some, you know, mapping on the social determinants and some uh, extensions on the SDI to really improve the identification of patients who are having adverse outcomes as a result of under service. And it's not just current uh, service uh, delivery, but it's historical. Um, so patient of population 75 with poor nutrition and lifestyle with a high prevalence of diabetes and renal failure are gonna need a bunch of different kinds of interventions um, than, than, than the 18 year olds in that same community. Um, so the social drivers are critical. They're at the root of our mission and at the root of our, um, our analytic strategy. And I think they have to be factored in. Um, you know, there's also, you know, this, uh, you know the individualization is, um, is critical in, the, in terms of, you know, if you're trying to drive perfect outcomes for patients who aren't capable of achieving perfect outcomes, you're going to frustrate docs and you're going to frustrate patients. Um, so, you know, finding the right 
finding the right individualized goals, driving to those goals, and then updating the goals um, to make progress is a much more effective strategy than just setting out some kind of North Star that's unachievable. So, um, so if I got that right, Shelley, if that, if that was your, the focus of your question, um, it's really, again, integral to the approach. And, and again, this goes back to the organizational goals, right? What are the things you're trying to accomplish? What are your guiding principles? You should really automate information flow and do calculations on input data on behalf of the providers when those calculations tightly align with the things you're trying to get done as an organization. So, you know, we have a bunch of things around safe opioid prescribing, um, but most of the opioids for our patients are prescribed uh, by pain management specialists outside of our control. So we just try to mistake proof the stuff that goes on outside of our organization. Um, we think it's important, but there are a lot more resources uh, and, and opioid addiction is a huge problem in the elderly and cause of tremendous morbidity and mortality. But we try to automate the things that are inside our population that are totally under our control. Things like fall prevention, um, automating the steady assessment by the CDC, uh, launching it at the right point in time, putting some templates around gate and, um, and medication and um, other assessments. Um, automating the physical therapy referrals, et cetera. And we found that by doing those kinds of things and by bringing high risk for falls patients into team-based care plans that we could reduce falls and fracture admissions by over 20% in, in the markets where we've had uh, full adoption of those tools. So, so it's really around the goals um, that, that matter the most, so. Okay, and quick, just quickly, because um, we have a couple more questions, but Shelly had a follow-up. Um, about pharmacy being concerned about the use of CDS um, for evidence-based medication prescription when the clinical trials just don't get don't aren't done using the aging population. How do you do? You, is there a way that you have to a good way to? <laughs> so, so that's an incredibly important question, and this cuts across the whole organization, not just the CDSs, but. Um, so right now, for example, you know, semaglutide is rising up on, on, the, on, the, on the utilization uh, you know, ladder, and most of the utilization is not evidence-based. And we know from prior experience that uh, the drugs that get pushed out um, early on and they're you know, based on, on some snippets of evidence often end up having some adverse events that um, nobody expected. So we're very careful about those things. Um, but what this gets back to the learning age-friendly health system, Shelley. And we try to look not just at um, the external evidence, but we also look at how our patients are doing. How are our patients on Synthroid who are over 85 doing? How are our patients on insulin uh, doing? And we build a lot of those care triggers I mentioned around some of those, some of those equations. So for example, patients now on sulfonylureas over the age of 75 really need to be deprescribed. And so we're systematically eliminating that drug from our pharmacopeia in, in older adults, um, but not letting semaglutide replace it. Uh, same for insulin. Insulin is a drug that has a tremendous amount of risk associated with it in very old adults who already have advanced complicated diabetes. So no evidence doesn't mean no decision support. No evidence means you have to double down on your database and your clinical teams and your analytics teams, and you have to identify um, what's happening to the patients who are receiving those medications at you know on your you know at your command, and making sure that the health outcomes are what you expect. And it's more critical in older, vulnerable adults than anywhere. And again, one of the great things that we that we automated early on was called low hanging fruit. It was a it was an article in the American Geriatric Society by Dr. Joseph Auslander, who happens to be their editor. And he described four classes of drugs um, that really have been overprescribed into almost, almost to the point of um, you know, pronouncing death. And so we're trying to get rid of the low hanging fruit. Um, Joe Auslander says he's on a personal mission to eliminate hypoglycemia and hypotension, iatrogenic hypoglycemia and iatrogenic hypotension 
as adverse health outcomes in America, right? And decision support tools are phenomenal for that, looking at heart rates and blood pressures and drug regimens, et cetera. So those are, there's, there's ways around the problem of the paucity of evidence in older vulnerable adults um, that you can get at using CDSS tools, so. Fabulous, thank you. We have three more questions that are actually pretty tightly um, related. Um, they, are, they are about adherence to care guidelines and how clinicians feel about CDS tools, whether they're, you know, how the balance between burden and utility and then the, the other side of utility and um, implementation is the uh, legal and insurance liability issues with, um, with CDS at the point of care. Yeah, yep, those are great questions. Um, and I you know, sort of mentioned it and we can talk a little more about it, but getting physician buy-in early on, helping them understand the queries, where the data comes from, the time lag oftentimes, uh, you know, lag in data or gaps in data can pr produce uh, erroneous results in the calculations um, that can really be a burden uh, for the providers. So you have to really pick the measures that you can reliably deliver at a very high degree of um, certainty uh, to providers on things that matter to them that will achieve a better health outcome. You do those things and your docs will be very grateful um, I call that thinking along your doctors, not thinking alongside your doctors, not thinking for your doctors. Um, so th those are critical. Um, and, and I think one of the big disservices in CDSS and the big dissatisfier early on was interaction checking, where people just got bombarded with alerts and they had to put filters on the alerts and they'd have, right? And, and so you were constantly prescribing through you know, red flag alerts because it was the right thing to do for that patient. Now, most of the time they should really not prescribe those drugs, I will tell you. Um, you know, therapeutics, especially in older adults, is we have a long way to go to, to achieve a really high, high quality as a, as a standard across the, uh, across the country. But with that said, um, it becomes that liability issue that was mentioned. That says if the if the doctor clicks through the red flag alert and the person has an adverse drug event, or or an adverse health outcome, uh, and you trail back to that to that uh, suppression of that message, who who has the liability? As as Michael said, we don't have lawyers on this call, or maybe we do, but I will tell you that in the end, physicians are responsible for the things they. Um, you know, they, they order for, on behalf of their patients. Um, we hold doctors accountable for all health outcomes. Um, and I think that, um, you know, m medical mistakes uh, will be accentuated uh, if you uh, do your CDSS tools incorrectly because you're gonna have physician fatigue and they're gonna trigger through. So it's really critical. Um, I think most of the most of the interaction checking systems have gotten a heck of a lot better over the last you know 15 years. Um, but all of the tools that we're talking about today are going to go through that same kind of you know life cycle. So again, plan, do, study, act, plan, do, study, act. Really important to have a flywheel approach to the tools you deliver to your providers and get better and better at acquiring data analyzing, well, transforming data, analyzing data, delivering data, and um, getting feedback on health outcomes associated with the delay data you're delivering. So very important, so. Awesome, thank you. I don't see any more questions in the chat or anybody's hand raised. Um, we have a couple more minutes, I think, so don't wanna dissuade anyone if you have a an interest or a question but while we while we wait I'll take the opportunity to poke you a little bit more on that on the last one about if you could just go a little bit deeper into the um onto sort of the, the usability like the <laughs> how do you how do you make sure that you know when you're when you got something like that for instance is an important drug drug interaction alert that is gonna because it's the just it needs to be a pop-up alert how do you 
how do you think about designing those and implementing those in ways that don't get ignored or over overlooked? So usability is probably, in my mind, the single most important attribute um, that leads to effective adoption, right? So usability near and dear. So, you know, design and, you know, in a, in a former company, we had a tremendous team of, um, you know, UX and design people who worked on that. Um, but, but, you know, I'd say at the, at the basis of all of this, Michael, is, um, is the, how, how do we say this? So um, making sure that um, physicians are, that all of the queries and all of the um, results and all of the interfaces are uh, built um, around the physician patient relationship. Um, if you don't have physicians at the table um, helping with the requirements and the testing and, um, and providing feedback on that, um, you're going to come up short. Um, you know, the, it's got to be a very provider centric process that leads to a very provider centric um, you know, process. So, um, you know, yeah, the providers are critical here. Um, you know, I'll just give you an example. So I got into this field, um, you know, in 19, 2002, um, they automated the nursing home and they automated the physician office. And our physicians went from office to nursing home and back. And we used to sit with the nurses and we would go through a list of 20 questions for every patient and they would answer them. And then we'd go out and see the patients. And suddenly the nurses were at the keyboard typing in assessments and, and there was nobody to answer our 20 questions. So um, the very smart people, um, the system analysts on both of those systems, we sat and went through that. And they put the assessments that the physicians needed in the nursing home record and the, built the uh, templates in the physician record to receive the data from the nursing home record. And I could write, and suddenly I knew who, who took their supplements, who had a pressure ulcer, who had a fall, who had visitors from a family who went to activities, uh, who had a changing condition. And so um, I, could, I, could, I could see patients faster. I had better insight into my patients. I had more time to spend with patients and families around the things that mattered to them and not the stuff that I was trying to load into a note. And, um, and so I think usability um, and decision support are, um, again, near and dear to my heart. You have to automate things that are potential pain points for the docs. You have to include them in your um, development uh, you know, process and testing and implementation and training. And, um, and I think you'll get over most of that alert fatigue. I really do believe that, so. Great, thank you. One more, we have another FDA question, which is, uh, C are there some CDS solutions that are used in more than one state? FDA has authority to regulate devices that are distributed across different state lines, to my understanding. I'll take the second half, which is, FDA's authority, again, they've, they've recently clarified their approach to regulating what is and to deciding what is and what is not considered a device in the CDS realm. And I have to <laughs> refer you to them for that. But I, I don't know if, if, Bill, you want to talk a little bit about solutions that get, and we'll talk more about solutions that are reusable later. Um, but if, Bill, you just want to talk quickly about using CDS in multiple sites. Um, no, you know, uh, technology, you know, the most overused word in technology for a long time was platform, right? Everything was a platform. Um, but health, health information technology really depends upon an enterprise wide uh, support. And if you want to call that a platform, you can. And so if your organization is going across multiple, um, um, you know, multiple jurisdictions, um, you have to make sure you're in complete compliance with all of the uh, state-specific regulations. I think nothing's more complicated than pharmacy uh, because the boards of pharmacy have such, um, you know, such, you know, call it jurisdiction over that. So um, we're, very, we're very cognizant of those state and local requirements. I'm not, I, I, I'm not sure, Michael, I don't believe the FDA regulates the flow of information into an EHR. Um, as a medical device, 
I really don't believe that's the case, but I think if you had a machine that was sitting there, oops, it came out of my little thing. If you had a machine that was sitting alongside your dock, like, um, you know, like a uh, personal, you know, a digital assistant or something like that, I think you'd be, you'd be um, on the boundary of a, of a medical device. And so I think you better, uh, you better uh, get to know those FDA regulations pretty carefully. And it sounds like they're under evolution, Michael. So yeah, they they released. They actually did release, and um, during the break, I will try to find the uh, link to put in the chat. But they they did a um, essentially a tool to walk through deciding if your if your thing is a CD is a device CDS or a non device CDS. And again, it you know I'm not the expert on that. Let alone I'm not FDA, not a lawyer, but. I can put the link to their tool and their guidance in the in the chat for folks to review. And I, I'm afraid, oh, there it is. Somebody else just put it into the uh, thing and I will copy it into the group chat. And there is one more question from, um, from Patrick in the chat. Uh, in primary care patients uh, have many problems such as diabetes plus depression plus CHF. Do you advocate three different tools or one for each patient? And thank you, Greg, for copying that in. Um, so, yeah, I mentioned Anish Chopra, one of my personal heroes, and Anish always says, solve the N of one. Um, simplicity is really critical. Multi-complexity is one of the, the five M's. No, you, you really need to do um, the calculations on each individual patient. Now, you know, so, so when you look at, for example, a deep prescribing uh, recommendation in a patient like that, you're going to absolutely have to um, individualize the results of the decision support with a conversation with the patient and a plan. So for example, you know, we have patients who might be on an incontinence medicine that um, increases that, that, you know, that's anticholinergic, and then they might be on a memory enhancing drug that, 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 that increases, you know, that's a cholinesterase inhibitor, right? So um, in order to resolve that conflict, you have to have a conversation with the patient. So, so the CDS tool there is just to alert the fact that there's potentially conflicting therapies and then to resolve by removing one or both or changing a drug, et cetera. So, so the recommendation has to be a more of a, of a spotlight on a potential concern than, than telling the doc exactly what it is they need to do as a result. And then for example, with deep prescribing of insulin or sulfonylureas, you know, we continue to track that. So if a patient has um, a, a sulfonylurea removed and then they haven't had a follow-up um, glycated hemoglobin level in three months, we'll alert them. Or if the glycated hemoglobin level uh, rises to a pretty significant degree, we'll alert the doc that says, hey, you know, you, know, you tried doing nothing. It's not working. Uh, the old drug wasn't, you know, really what they needed, but maybe you ought to be thinking about something else. So, so I think that, you know, I think it's the point in the decision making that is really communicated to the provider, right? So um, sometimes you want the docs to complete the algorithm with the patient in an individualized way, and sometimes you want the doc to um, to act on a recommendation. And they're very different, and they really are uh, specific to the condition. Um, so I hope that made sense for you. Okay, I don't see any more questions popping up anywhere. Thanks for the folks, again, putting the uh, FDA links in the chat. Um, Allison, do you see? No, I think uh, you've got answers to all the questions that have been asked. So um, I think it's all right then if we move on um, to our break. Um, so we will be back at 1.20 to introduce the tools that we have as today's case studies. So um, we will see you all again at 1.20. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to all the participants as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Bill.
All right. Welcome back from break, everyone. Um, hope everyone had a chance to get some water, coffee, tea. We'll now get started and move into our next portion of our agenda, which will focus on presentations on implementation of CDS in the real world. We'll hear from Buck Rogers from Medical University of South Carolina on CDS for opioid prescribing using CDS hooks, followed by Lydia Drumwright from University of Washington, who will discuss the clinical opioid summary with prescription integration tool, also known as COSRI, developed by UW. Followed by Patrick O'Connor and Deepa Apna from Health Partners Institute, who will provide an overview of their Priority Wizard CDS tool. Following the presentations, we will have time for question and answer. Please submit any questions you have using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I will now turn it over to Buck Rogers. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity for us to share our work here. Um, yeah, again, my name is Buck Rogers. I work for the Medical University of South Carolina uh, Biomedical Informatics Center um, here at MUSC. And uh, we are going to, uh, can I get the next slide? Ah, beautiful. Um, great. Thank you. Um, under Dr. Les Leonard, uh, Director of Biomedical Informatics Center, also our CRIO, um, and also a main contributor to this project uh, was uh, Wei Ding, who's our Senior Interface Developer Architect. So with that being said, um, we're going to share um, our pilot with Epic Smart on Fire and CDC guidelines using the CDS Hooks technology for opioid pain management. Um, next slide, please. So again, here's the BMIC team. Uh, the only uh, person not on here is our project manager, Luke Sox, who is again, great in helping this, uh, this project get going. Next slide, please. So our contractor contributions. Um, major shout out to Greg White. Um, he was instrumental in helping us uh, keep the pieces together and very supportive of, of our pilot. So appreciate all the help, Greg. Next slide, please. Here's government leadership. Um, Allison, uh, shout out to you. Thanks for um, helping with the slide deck and get everything ready um, for the presentation. All right, uh, next slide, please. So here's a, a picture of a traditional pop-up. Um, during this pilot, we successfully tested both this traditional pop-up, uh, which you see here, and we use more of an innovation, innovative approach due to a term called BPA fatigue, which I know we've touched on um, a little today. Um, and so that's kind of what 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 drove a lot of our our uh, our pilot for for a couple projects. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, so BPA fatigue in general science is a, is a term where there are too many pop-ups that clinicians get. So they become desensitized to them and ignore clinically relevant ones for patients during their normal workflow. Um, during a traditional CDS intervention, um, the EHR user must wait for the CDS to complete its evaluation and then provide a response before continuing with their EHR activity. Um, you know, if the CDS evaluation takes noticeable time to complete, um, it will also slow down um, the user's interaction with the EHR, uh, can cause delays in, in workflow with patients. Um, next slide, please. So we kind of took a three-pronged approach uh, to this pilot. Um, the first BPA, we use the interruptive, um, which is that first screenshot I showed you. Um, also a standard flu screening pop-up. You know, these are the pop-ups that I think we all know, if, you know, at least in epic world, they just pop up in your face and say, hey, this patient needs X, Y, and Z, um, inter inter interrupts the, uh, the workflow. Um, the second one um, we didn't really test with, it's just a background BPA. Um, this could be anything from, uh, something triggers in the system, so it sends an in-basket message to the doctor or nurse saying, hey, patient, you know, needs X, Y, and Z. Um, again, it, it, it's a great tool, um, but it's not, you know, point of care, so we didn't really focus on that one. What we did come up with was this new innovation was where we would use, using decision rules, we would input a note or a smart form in a cl clinician's note um, instead of using the pop-up BPA. Um, this helped with alert fatigue. Um, again, it doesn't interrupt the flow sheet, or sorry, the, the workflow. Um, and, uh, and and BPAs are a heavy lift on the system. So cognitively, it, it helps out with the system running. Uh, next slide, please. 
Yeah, so here's an example um, in Epic Production at MUSC where we developed a non-interruptive decision support intervention. Uh, it combined a detailed overdose documentation template um, in our ER department with a reminder to use the tool, uh, which is what you see here in, in the red, red uh, phrasing. Um, this was automatically inserted into the provider's note by decision rules. Um, in this case, the nurse has entered drug overdose as chief complaint for the patient, which is what triggered the role to show up here. Um, we also triggered it by comments, um, including Narcan, Naloxone, or overdose. So that also triggers this non-interruptive alert inside the, the clinician's note. Um, and I'm not sure how big that is, but, but the, the phrasing says, if you feel this patient is presenting with an opioid overdose, please use the dot opioid smart phrase for documentation. And please delete this reminder from your note. So the physician just deletes that, puts dot op opioid. And next slide, please. And this detailed smart form pops up, which is on the left side of the screen um, and is accessible. Um, a lot of selecting options, and that pretty much navigates and populates the note on the right side of the screen. Um, additional documentation can also be hidden in the smart form to, to help the uh, provider with being overwhelmed with unnecessary information. Um, but if you can see, the um, it's asking, was naloxone given pre-hospitalization? Who administered it? Um, and then from there, branching logic happens to curate the note um, for the provider to... Um, sign at the, at the end of the, the visit. Um, next slide, please. So here's a graph that is showing um, the higher increase of ordering these um, overdose kits when the non-interruptive smart form was used for documentation. Um, yeah, these higher take-home naloxone prescribing in pre-post study across a multitudinal health system, which in this case was MUSC. Um, so the, the kind of the difference is, you know, the timing's a little different um, with this non to BPA. It, it kind of happens at the end when the clinician has is looking at their note, um, doesn't interrupt them during the, the, the workflow. So um, it doesn't interrupt the cognition. Um, and it, we found that it was better accepted in, in this case. Uh, next slide, please. So to do that, and then the, the, the pilot that we did with the CDC using CDS, um, Wei Ding, who's our software architect developer, um, created a BMIC gateway. And it's, uh, it's a bi-directional EMR integration for secure real-time data exchange. Uh, this provides a scalable real-time solution for using CDS hooks response cards and writing them back into Epic using uh, flow sheets. So with this method, uh, clinicians now have the option to get feedback from smart text documents instead of showing the pop-up alerts in real-time secure way. Um, so this is a couple of projects we're working on now um, that we're kind of using this method to 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 see how it to see how it um it it helps clinicians maybe get past that fatigue alert. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so here are the, uh, so with the, with the pilot, we focus primarily on recommendation 10 and recommendation 11. Um, and this chart is just showing how they're triggered. Um, so recommendation 10 is triggered, um, the CDS was triggered from order sign, and then recommendation 11 is triggered on order select. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so... For the CDS CDC pilot recommendation uh, 10, this is a technical flow chart starting from the triggering event of order sign of an opioid to the smart on fire logic to then send back the user recommendations via one of the alerts, um, which is what I'm show, showing you here. And the recommendation 10 is when prescribing opioids for chronic pain, clinicians should use drug testing before starting opioid therapy and consider urine drug testing at least annually to assess prescribed medications as well as other controlled prescription drugs and illicit. Um, won't go too much into this now. It, it's pretty in depth, but these slides will be shared. So, um, you know, feel free to dig into this more and, and reach out to us if, if there's any questions of a certain piece of this. Um, next, thank you. So again, so this screenshot is um, patient has a positive PCP um, in benzo result from a urine drug screening. 
Um, that is what's triggering our CDS uh, hook. And that is what's pulling the card in, which is showing a pop-up alert, which will be on the next slide, please. Great. Yeah, so this screenshot shows the interrupted VPA uh, alert. I just keep saying interrupted because I'm trying to differentiate the two. Um, the standard traditional VPA alert at the order sign step in Epic for the provider. Um, you can see at the bottom right there that the sign orders is, is checked in, block, blocked out. Um, anyways, this is a CDS hooks card being returned in the interrupted fashion. Um, the pop-up lets the provider know that this patient was positive for either cocaine or PCP. Um, the pop-up allows the provider to click on the CDC guideline um, and or removing the opioid order before moving forward. Um, these alerts interrupt the user's interactions with the EHR and force the user to respond um, in a manner by accepting or declining the recommendation. Um, so that is the recommendation 10 order sign alert. Uh, next slide, please. So using our more innovative approach, or I guess unique approach, um, like the overdose template that I showed you earlier, um, we're using flow sheets to store the CDS cards um, in the system to automatically insert them uh, to a note to manage the patient's pain medication. So we're storing what we're calling the summary, the indicator, indicator and the detail. Um, positive for cocaine, this is a warning. And then the detail is um, what, what we're kind of curating the note with. Um, so that's just kind of showing where we're storing the, the data um, differently than the interruptive. Uh, next slide, please. So in the green box, uh, so here, here are the three flow sheets, nicely formatted note. Um, the non-interruptive alert lets a provider fill out a pre-populated template um, regarding the patient and what the CDC guidelines are for prescribing opioids for pain management in this case with a positive urine drug training. Um, the note includes what what the pop what the interruptive pop up is automatically showing, but it's automatically inserting that into the note for the provider um, as to not interrupt their workflow in this case. Um, studies have compared the efficacy of interruptive and non-interruptive alerts, and they suggest this this approach is a little more effective. Um, and again, if you can read that, it's it's going through the uh, opioid management and uh, the long-term care for the patient. So it's laid out real nice. And again, it's it's pulling in what the pop-up had um, into the actual clinician's note. So this was automatically inserted. There was no dot phrase that had to be done. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so here's the, the last um, recommendation 11, uh, interruptive alert for prescribing an opioid while the patients have a concurrent opioid prescription. Um, this CDS alert was triggered on order select. From this pop-up, the clinician also has the option um, to either cancel the order from here or keep it before moving forward with the, with the workflow. Um, and in this same approach, we can also curate uh, a non-interruptive alert using decision rules uh, for this recommendation. Um, it would look very similar to recommendation 10 as a non-interruptive approach. And the first example with the opioid OD, that was more of a smart form. So now we're trying to take that more sophisticated approach and now applying them to recommendation 10 and 11. Um, so it, it, it can, it's more of a robust uh, way to fill out their note and gives them more options. Um, so that's kind of next, that's what we're doing there. Um, and finally, the last slide, please. Yeah, so in conclusion, um, this new non-interruptive technology is very promising for decision support using CDS hooks. Uh, both tools can be used in clinical decision support. Um, we can use the tra traditional method inside the EHR or more of an advanced external method using Smart on Fire Gateway for pulling the information back back into the flow sheets, which again can then create that automatic note in the clinician's, uh, yeah, in the clinician's workflow at the end when the note uh, writing is, is occurring. Um, and pre preliminary data does show this method being more effective, um, but you know, there are definitely, definitely more, more study on this to, to prove um, its overall effectiveness across the board. Um, 
And with that, I appreciate it. And that's all we, that's all I have. Um, obviously I'll be here for questions um, afterwards and thank you all so much. Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and get um, started without introduction. Um, I'm Lydia Drumright. Thank you for having me here. Um, my uh, colleague Bill Lober and I um, have been developing the clinical opioid summary with RX integration, which we call Causery. Um, but we've also been integrating that with another tool that we have called Pain Tracker. And really, this is about extending a smart on fire application for a more integrated patient experience. And um, because, oops, next slide. Thanks. Because everyone here is probably not familiar with Causery, I just wanna go through a little bit of background on Causery, next slide. Um, so we started developing Causery um, with uh, the state of Washington. And I'm sorry, there seems to be an error with this slide that wasn't there before when we went through them, but that's okay. Um, so uh, as everyone's aware, prescription drug monitoring programs were established in the US to sort of help curl tail the uh, US opioid epidemic. And the idea here was that you would increase information exchange to support more informed prescribing by the providers. Um, but there was some evidence early on that there was suboptimal use um, reported by prescribers. And in Washington state, um, fatal overdoses of non-heroin opioids continue to increase. So um, panel one shows you across the U.S. and panel two is Washington state. And um, despite Department of Health's efforts, um, opioid prescribing rates are still really, really high um, in Washington state, as you can see in panel three. And in 2019, one of our colleagues at UW did a study to, um, to figure out what was going on with providers and PDMP. And um, the providers in Washington state said it was really difficult accessing PDMP. There were cost barriers, there were technical barriers. So the idea for Causery originally was to help support access to PDMP. Next slide, please. And the framework for building this um, was uh, done in partnership with Washington State Department of Health. And we were looking at their um, overdose and opioid response plan. And one of the strategies was that providers um, utilize PDMP uh, more and um, more effectively. And so um, we are the University of Washington Clinical Informatics Research Group. And um, we decided to go ahead and develop a clinical decision support app for opioid prescribing. And it was really important to us to include healthit.gov standards so that this was usable across not only the state of Washington, but other places. And um, we wanted to increase the use of PDMP and um, support these standards and use other um, health IT uh, supported um, technology such as clinical quality language. Next slide, please. Um, so we designed an open source smart on fire application, and that is based off the AHRQ CDS Connect Pain Management Summary project. So we use that as our template. We did a lot of reworking of the code. So if you've seen their um, template, uh, Causery today looks nothing like that. Uh, we also did a lot of iterative end user participatory design um, to help uh, get an app that met the provider's needs. And um, next slide, please. And one of the important things that we had to do 
because the providers of the pilot clinics we were going to work with needed to um, use this as a standalone because they didn't have um, sophisticated EHRs that could integrate a smart on fire application. So in that pink box there, we developed something we call the faux EMR that we call femur for short. And that actually mimics what an um, EHR would do. And then um, in the green box, and I know this is very technical, I'm not going to go into all of it, is the cause reapplication. So um, it can plug directly into um, a, an EHR like Epic or Cerner or any of the other ones that support smart on fire applications, or it can stand alone. Next slide, please. So um, I just wanted to highlight here, we have two demo versions of Causery. Uh, one is the freestanding version, which um, you can access there. And one is an EHR integrated version, which um, you can access on the Smart Health IT. Um, and you can go to the freestanding version by that demo system link and you get a login screen that looks like this. Next slide, please. And um, in your demonstration version, we have a bunch of um, patients that we've made that represent different things. You can search those patients um, at the top by um, name. So these demo versions do all the same things as the live versions, but of course they um, contain fictitious data and patients. Next slide, please. And when you select a patient, you get an overview of their um, opioid uh, pain prescribing um, summary here. And what you can see in this slide is um, that we have uh, the MME calculated here. So the morphine equivalent doses or the mor morphine um, equivalents there that we have um, uh, on a graph over time. And then you have a um, summary box up above looking at co-prescribing and the number of providers and the number of pharmacies and some alerts that we have in the system. Next slide, please. And you can scroll down further in this application and look at all those features. If you look at that gray sidebar, look at all the features that we have and look more in depth with um, those. Next slide, please. So we um, implemented this at two primary care clinics in September and October of 2021. Um, these were nurse practitioner owned and led clinics. Um, they had, uh, they needed the standalone version because they had what we would consider low technology EHRs. They couldn't integrate um, smart on fire uh, uh, tools. And um, these clinics serve about 50% Medicaid patients. Um, so they really needed help. The only way they could access the system was buying into another system or logging in through the um, state uh, web portal. And we evaluated their use um, using a mixed method approach. Uh, just to highlight to everyone, they are still using the Causery app and we are still following them up for evaluation. Um, we looked at Causery app logs for evaluation, which we are still doing. We did qualitative interviews. And within the time period that I'm showing here, which is 26 weeks of evaluation, they had... Um, they had, uh, well, actually I've got 52 weeks of evaluation at the bottom, but for 26 weeks, they had nearly 2000 patient views and only nine user support issues logged. Um, the providers uh, told us the one thing that, that made the system really useful to them and they really liked it was because it was so fast to access data on a patient. So we timed them logging into their um, usual systems and it took them about two and a half minutes to access PDMP information on a patient. Um, from the logs, we could see that it took them about 18 seconds on average to access a patient. That's a huge difference in a pri busy primary care clinic. 
And um, so they were able to refer back. They also told us that they started looking at other controlled substances because they could view them all. And um, as you can see from the graph there, uh, there was high use. Next slide, please. So um, at UW, we have the Center for Pain Relief, which is um, a UW Medicine chronic pain referral center. It provides a wide range of treatment, support, and guidance for chronic pain. Their emphasis is on non-opioid pain management because um, they're experts in this area. And as we all know, opioids are not a um, very effective treatment for chronic pain. And um, they are also one of the few chronic pain specialty centers that accepts Medicaid patients in the state of Washington. Most other centers have a very small limit for Medicaid patients. And so the primary care providers told us they often have a hard time referring their Medicaid patients. Um, we had been working with them previously with a uh, patient-facing patient application called Pain Tracker. And Pain Tracker is a patient reported outcomes and measures capture tool that captures key health information additional to pain that um, providers thought was necessary to sort of treat the patient well. They originally had a paper version in the clinic, but that was difficult to integrate um, with the EHR. And so in 2014, we started providing them with a web-based version um, so their patients log in separately, they can complete this at home, and then they get a PDF um, sent electronically to the clinic, which gets uploaded to their um, chart in Epic. And um, we originally had this idea that we could integrate Causery and Pain Tracker. The providers were very excited about it because they wanted an interactive um, version of Pain Tracker but also they felt like this provided a holistic or what they call a 365 degree view of the patient when assessing pain. And um, you know, the patient was then providing more input into their experience in care. And they felt like this would improve um, care delivery. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and talk about pain tracker just briefly. Next slide, please. So the thing about pain tracker and why they implemented the paper version to begin with is that chronic pain is really complicated. It can be impacted by other factors. Mental health is a huge factor impacting chronic pain. And we even heard this from the um, primary care providers that they felt like there were other issues influencing the chronic pain and the need for opioids. It can also be influenced by um, sleep and other uh, poor sleep and other things like that. And so treatment of mental health outcomes, treatment of sleep issues can reduce experience of pain. And, you know, as we all are aware, opioid therapy needs are driven by other factors. There are risk for dependency, family histories. These are different for different individuals. And patients are unaware, often unaware that they become dependent on prescribed opioids. Um, and we particularly saw this when um, primary care providers told us they were de-escalating patients and the patients would say, wow, I didn't realize how, what a cloud I was living in, how much I didn't experience life until I de-escalated. So um, really important there. And then of course, the goals at the clinic for um, chronic pain management are functionality, not pain-free experience. And that's based on a um, algorithm peg that's uh, widely used. Next slide, please. Um, so we also have a demo link for pain tracker. If you go to that link there, um, you get the screen on the bottom left that says chronic pain, and then that will take you to this um, screen in the uh, top right there, which is um, our demo screen and, and what patients see when they log in, except for they don't see demo. Next slide, please. And what this app looks like is, remember, this is a PRO app for patient reported outcomes and measures. So they get questionnaires like the one on the left-hand side there. And then they also get questions about where their pain is that they fill out on the body map on the um, right-hand side. Next slide, please. And the items that we assess are a number of pain items, 
sleep items, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, opioid risks, and um, other measures that uh, providers had um, noted were important for understanding um, chronic pain. Next slide, please. And so um, along with uh, uh, ONC, we have a project to um, integrate cause and pain tracker. Next slide, please. And we started that this year. So um, what uh, you have here is the information flow. So a patient will complete pain tracker at any point in time um, in their own free time or while they're waiting to see the provider in the clinic. And that pushes all their pain tracker data to our um, FHIRE database in FEMER. Then at the bottom, when a provider launches COSRI, they have access to those data in COSRI. And I'll show you that in more detail. Next slide, please. Um, so if you recall from the previous screen that I showed you with COSRI alone and not COSRI pain tracker, um, I have an additional box at the bottom of those summaries down there, and that last box is your questionnaire summary from Pain Tracker, and I'm just showing three of the elements right now in that, but it shows you what their scores are and whether or not that's up or down from the last time they um, completed Pain Tracker because they complete this for every visit. Next slide, please. And then you can see at the top, I have two tabs. That overview tab was the original COSRI tab where they still can see all the details on the medications from the PDMP. And this second tab is the pain tracker report. And so what they can see is over time, this is their summary screen on the pain tracker report. Over time, they can visualize um, what people's responses, overall um, responses to questionnaires were. They can visualize the pain map. Next slide, please. And they can scroll down and actually see details on each of the questionnaires. Next slide, please. There's information about each of the questionnaires in case the provider is not familiar with this because there are plans to use this across the University of Washington Medicine. Next slide, please. And then you can see a history of how patients responded to each question. So if it's their responses are changing, you can see where they're changing. Next slide, please. So um, right now we have a prototype ready. Um, it has been put into our development system and also into the stage system so that providers can test it in stage on their real patients. Um, we are doing qualitative think out loud sessions starting next week with our providers to get feedback on whether or not this fits well with their workflow, whether or not the presentation makes sense for them and their logic and reasoning for the patients. And um, measuring other things such as their current challenges, additional tools they might need, additional CDS they might need, and, and so on. And um, then we will go back to the, sorry, next slide. We will go back to cause repaint tracker um, integration, update it based on their needs and pull over all of the other data we have to create fire questionnaire responses for every single one of those other questionnaires because they don't exist uh, out in the world that we have access to at the moment. And um, we will develop implementation guidance. Um, we'll have a production instance, we'll do training, and then we will pilot test at um, UW Medicine. We're hoping to start that um, by the end of summer or next fall and have iterative development with the providers and evaluation um, using uh, the usage metrics and qualitative interviews. Next slide, please. And um, with that, I just want to highlight our development team in blue there, uh, who are the current programmers for the project and others who started with the project but are no longer on it. Um, other research partners are partners over at the state of Washington 
and also the um, funding that's been provided by ONC and um, others. And I really want to highlight ONC funding. This is not just for this project, but the funding of the AHRQ means that we had a platform to start with. Um, Smart on Fire apps, if people have worked with them, are a pretty heavy lift for developers who have never seen them before, but that um, really got us started and has helped make this project possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lydia. Um, we'll now turn it over to Patrick and Deepa. Thank you. I'm Patrick O'Connor. I'm a family doc. I work at Health Partners in uh, a research, a large healthcare delivery system and research unit in Minnesota. And Deepa, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Sure. I'm Deepa Pana. I manage the software engineering team at the Health Partners Institute. And we've worked on, uh, you know, developing all the software infrastructure for this project. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, we had uh, the work we're describing has been funded by HRQ and one, two, three, four, five, six NIH institutes plus PCORI and CMS and other sources, CDC. Uh, we don't have any industry interest for funding. Next slide. I'm going to talk about, we're going to talk about a tool called Priorities Wizard. It's designed to provide clinical decision support in primary care settings. That's really important, primary care settings, um, and addresses primarily uh, management of chronic, uh, common chronic conditions like diabetes, hypertension, lipids, and things like that. Um, it's also been used in uh, emergency room settings, and um, it's uh, used peripherally in some specialty settings like endocrinology and in the past cardiology, a little bit in nephrology, but it's designed for primary care use. Um, it's been funded and developed uh, with the first grant coming from ARC in around 2006, and we've had about 12 NIH or federal grants uh, to support its development. Um, it's currently in use at uh, about 12 sizable medical groups located in 10 different states that provide care to about 3 million patients. And we've, uh, using the grant funding from NIH and other sources, we've conducted a series of clinic randomized trials to assess the intervention, uh, CDS intervention and clinical outcomes. And we've been able to demonstrate that we were uh, able to achieve in these clinic randomized trials, better glucose and blood pressure control in diabetes patients uh, better blood pressure care and control in uh, high-risk safety net patients, better blood pressure management and identification in adolescents, uh, improved CBD risk in adults uh, who don't have diabetes or CBD, as well as in those who do, um, and uh, decreased uh, uh, reversible CBD risk. That means better risk factor control in patients with serious mental illness, which is quite a big challenge patients with schizophrenia and bipolar or schizoaffective condition. Some of the uh, analyses showed that the effects in non-white populations were greater than they were in white populations. Uh, there have also been some studies that failed. For example, um, we did one randomized trial trying to use it for to improve identification management of pre-diabetes care. We could not get traction in that study. No one was interested. Um, so that one failed, but most of them have succeeded. And the decision support system has enjoyed persistently high use rates and clinician satisfaction ratings uh, really since 2008 when it went live. Uh, and it's been live ever since then in uh, some of these systems. Next slide. Because it's designed for primary care, I want to. Uh, take a little detour. I'm not sure who on the call has experience in primary care settings and who doesn't. I know that many of the presenters have experience in primary care, but I'm a family doc and have lived in this environment for decades. Uh, this is what it looks like these days. Uh, each encounter requires about 200, 300 mouse clicks, 200 by the doc, 100 by support staff. The docs see 18 to 25 patients a day. Each patient 
is, when you see a patient, you're not dealing with one problem. As a general rule, you're dealing with three to five problems from direct observation research. EMR in baskets are totally out of control. Uh, you see an endless stream of BPAs and alerts. Uh, these interrupt, even if they're not uh, um, hard stops, they interrupt uh, eye contact with the patient, interrupt thought patterns. Hard stops provoke rage reactions and uh, are not part of our vocabulary on this call today. Uh, if you think they're a great idea, I'd like to have a beer with you and talk about that. Um, and then uh, the average primary care doc is spending more than five hours a day in EMR documentation. Uh, EMRs have increased the workday about an hour and a half, and there's five hours of documentation out of 11 hour average workday, uh, annals of family medicine articles. And much of this EMR time is pajama time at home. Moreover, primary care clinicians get paid less than almost everybody else, uh, except psychiatrists. Yeah, and geriatrician. Um, and about 40% of all doctors, by the way, would choose not to be a doctor again these days. So that's the environment. Now, how appealing does that sound? So well, now you've got some researchers who think of the great idea of clinical decision support, and we're going to just pop that in there, and it's going to be nirvana. Care is going to go up, cost going to go down, patient satisfaction go through the roof. Next slide. That hasn't happened, um, even though uh, there's evidence that decision support increases processes of care, like uh, ordering A1Cs and uh, lipid tests. There's very little evidence that they consistently improve glucose and lipid management or outcomes. So what you basically have is more things being ordered, but no impact on the things that dictate clinical outcomes. So I'm a little cynical about that. I could show you about 80 articles that have showed that chronic disease decision support in primary care settings fails, including articles from Mass General and Mayo Clinic to Wright Regan Street. Um, but anyway, uh, rather than dwelling on the negative, uh, let's think about how to design a CDS system that overcomes some of the problems that have been previously observed. Uh, the number one problem is low use rates. And uh, what we've done to design our CDS system is follow these principles here. And we've applied them, um, and we'll describe a little bit what it looks like on the next couple of slides. But we have a system that's web-based. We have, I don't know, Deepa's program and her, her buddies have programmed thousands, tens of thousands of Java code and web services that translate a variety of guidelines for glucose, blood pressure, lipids, aspirin, smoking, weight, um, OUD, management of people with OUD, management of people with cognitive impairment, those are all been coded and are in a web service. Um, there's a connection between the web service and the EHR that you'll hear a lot about in a few minutes. Uh, that's the first thing. Second, so it's scalable and it's adaptable to changes in guidelines. Second, and you know, guidelines for blood pressure, lipids and glucose, I cannot count how many times they've changed since 2008. They change very, very regularly, many times a year. Across these different clinical domains, guidelines change many times a year. We're adapting it for cancer genetic syndromes, and those guidelines change three times, two times each year. So you need to have something that's adaptable. Second thing is that we try to make the decision support person-centered. And our early speakers, Drs. Russell and Mason, emphasized this. Um, it's really important not to have a full, in primary care land, it's really important not to have a bunch of disease specific tools and expect that they'll be used. Uh, multiple tools might be used at a single encounter. That is not going to happen. Uh, it's more important to have one display per patient and to integrate as many clinical domains as you can into that display. So that's the second principle. The third principle is if you do that, you're going to get a bunch of recommendations, right? Uh, because patients have multiple concerns. And you have to prioritize things. Kaiser in Portland, Oregon provided that list of things that were evidence-based and not delivered to their clinicians maybe 20 years ago. And the docs were, you know, almost went on strike. I mean, they got so upset because this thing got just tossed on the first screen, 20, 30, 40 things for a patient. They weren't prioritized. I don't know if they're in alphabetical order or what. Half of the doctors, uh, Clicked out of use of the system forever, you know, within the first couple of weeks. 
So this prioritization function is critical. The care suggestions need to be prioritized if you're going to take them across different clinical conditions because everything that's evidence-based is not of equal benefit to a given patient at a given point of time. That's like a really important thing. And the prioritization function is really important. It's a complicated thing. We can talk about it in questions if you want. But next thing is no mouse clicks. So, you, you know, doctors are not going to click if you're get, trying to get home at 8 o'clock at night and you're doing, you know, 25 times 200 clicks a day already, uh, 5,000 clicks a day already, <clears throat> you're not going to click any more times for BPA. So if you have to click uh, at all for, uh, for, I mean, for decision support, you're not going to do it. So we've de designed it with no mouse clicks by the clinician. And Deepa will tell you how we did that in a minute. Uh, we provided the, the decision support to both the patient and the doc, number five, to promote this shared decision making. And we have put in uh, active guideline features that uh, facilitate ordering of things, referrals, tests, uh, labs. Those are not used very often, but they're in there. And then dot phrases uh, that summarize decisions are, are wildly popular and uh, are used both for documentation purposes and in after visit summaries. Next slide. This is what the decision support looks for on the left looks like on the left is a version that's handed to the patient so uh, we target about 20 percent of adult outpatient visits in primary care we select those based on whatever you want to select them on but we pick uh for what i'll be talking to you today about patients with heart disease who are not at their uh, key clinical goals for blood pressure lipids uh, smoking and aspirin use. Patients with diabetes who are not at their key goals for A1C, blood pressure, lipids, uh, aspirin, and glucose. And uh, other patients without diabetes or heart disease that have multiple uncontrolled CV risk factors. That's who we target. That adds up to about 20% of the visits uh, in most primary case settings. And the patient sees this thing. If the patient is in that group, they see uh, the thing on the right. Uh, which is uh, a list of things uh, that are, are, re are related to cardiometabolic health with indicators of whether they should uh, basically talk to the clinician or not about these things. There's room for improvement. So for example, uh, the second one, uh, well, there's for blood sugar, the A1C goal is, is uh, customized for the patient and the patient's status is judged against that personalized A1C goal based on ADA guidelines. For cholesterol, the guidelines are based on the uh, ACC AHA uh, guidelines. For weight, they're based on ADA and uh, bariatric surgery guidelines. Uh, for blood pressure, they're based on national guidelines. And sometimes we integrate uh, geriatric guidelines with the national guidelines. As you know, there's like many guidelines for glucose and blood pressure out floating around out there. So the patient sees the thing on the right, which just basically says, these are the things that are important. Talk to your clinician. The clinician view on the left provides much more information. It takes account of uh, how much potential cardiovascular benefit there would be from uh, addressing a given thing, like lipids in this case, or glucose control. It uh, presents the patient's 10-year cardiovascular risk at the top in a gray line. And then it uh, shows for the different uh, uh, recommended things. Uh, takes account of current medicines, distance from goal, medication, allergies, renal function, kidney function, CHF status, and other things. And it uh, prioritizes these things based on potential benefit to the patient. This patient, number one thing is lipid, second, glucose control, third, weight. The docs don't have to read this thing, but if they want to, they can. And what we found is that uh, advanced practice providers like nurse practitioners and PAs often really like the detailed suggestions on drug use and starting dose. More experienced internists just glance at this thing as they walk in the door. All you have to see is lipids and glucose. You don't even have to stop. And that helps with visit planning. Next slide. There is a, a EMR automated version of this electronic version that's similar, but at the bottom in purple, it has quick links to order things that are recommended. Uh, next slide. This is uh, something that's domain specific to OUD. There's been a lot of talk about OUD or opioid use today. We don't target opioid use. We target more 
trying to identify patients who are at risk of overdose of people with high risk of OUD. And this uh, is kind of a nifty screen that our uh, addiction medicine and psychiatry folks came up with. There's At the bottom left, there's some radio buttons that are populated automatically for each patient based on whether they're pregnant, liver function, pulmonary function, uh, benzo use, et cetera. Um, and then the things on the right, the green circles that say go, are those are the different treatments for uh, opioid use disorder. And as you change the radio buttons, which are populated automatically, algorithmically, these things change from green to yellow to red, depending. So like if a person's pregnant, the only thing that's still green is, um, uh, you know, there's only one treatment. It's not the others sort of drop off the screen and they, you know, uh, so it tailors the treatment suggestion specifically uh, to the patient. Next slide. I'm gonna turn it over to Deepa. She's gonna talk about uh, how the uh, programming and uh, technology uh, works. And I just wanna say that uh, she's been working on this for 12 years and she's a genius. So Deepa, take it away. Thanks, Patrick. So uh, to just to actually implement everything that Patrick talked about, we need a lot of data that needs to flow into our decision support uh, algorithms to make uh, those decisions and uh, prioritize those recommendations. So on the left, you know, we see all the data that we extract. And on the right are the different domains that we have uh, kind of addressed in terms of algorithms and, uh, you know, the, each of those cards is a different domain. Next slide. Uh, so I just want to talk about a little bit about current our current architecture, and we are currently moving to fire, but, uh, you know, so how the transition is going and the challenges that we're facing. So our current act architecture is that we have custom code that's written in MOMS in uh, EPIC. Um, and then all the code, uh, you know, so every client that needs to implement this has to take our custom code and implement it in their system. And the other challenge right now is mapping client specific code. So a medication, each time we go to a new system, we have to look at, okay, what are those EMR IDs and what medication do they actually map to? Um, and then we rely on some EHR specific rules. Now, the advantage of this is that it is super fast and it's, you know, the whole round trip uh, is less than a second, sometimes less than 300 milliseconds. So it's just, it processes uh, it very fast for the amount of data that we are dealing with. Um, but um, the challenges of when we, uh, our current approach with implementing in a new system is that first it's limited to EPIC. It, it has a long implementation timeline, uh, about six to 18 months as we you know map these codes, get the connectivity figured out. And then there is a huge reluctance to maintain custom code. Uh, yeah, and then there are not many developers with this this type of skill set. So new uh, places are reluctant to implement this into their system. Next slide. Yeah, so this is a, a talks. I mean, I kind of talked about this, but basically the way our system works is the trigger is VP entry. There we have in the red box, our custom mumps program that uh, extracts the data, sends it to our web service. It's a SOAP request. So web service says, yes, this patient qualifies and uh, it generate some recommendations. And then um, pro, there's a pop-up BPA for the nurse and the nurse with the link to priority wizard. So uh, when the nurse clicks that, the pr wizard prints out and then the nurse gives it to the patient and puts one on the door. So next slide. So with all that, because of those challenges, um, we decided to move to a fire implementation. Now, this is something that is working at our site, but uh, you know, we are still in the process of learning a lot of this. And the way we did it is using CDS hooks uh, and we uh, use the Smart on Fire app launch. Uh, we also write back using fires, fire and um, 
you know, one of the advantages is, you know, standardized cord sets is what we had, is one of the advantages that we thought we would have. Uh, and then, of course, it's e EHR agnostic. It's a much quicker implementation at the site. And it's just a lot, uh, the build that happens in the EMR is a lot less. Uh, the challenges that we face is that there, there are a limited number of trigger points where, you know, we can uh, use CDS hooks. Um, uh, and then there is the latency. Um, it takes a long, because of the amount of data we need, it takes a long time to extract that. And some non-standard things, like say things that are implemented using smart forms and are, uh, we don't know where it's stored, every EMR stores it in a different place. And we still run into these issues of how to extract them. Uh, and again, saying that the, uh, not all organizations have the code sets implemented uniformly, right? Because sometimes PHQ-9 is stored in uh, in different places, depending on the organization. Uh, and then, you know, we have a dot phrase functionality right now in our current system that is used a lot, like almost all pri our primary care physicians have this uh, in their notes. Uh, but now with FHIR, we have yet to find a way to implement that. Next slide. Yeah, this is just generally, again, talking about how it is that, you know, our, we are able to have a CVS hook trigger at BP entry and then um, and a chart open. So what we do, the, this is how we have handled latency because it, we need that much amount of data. We have split out our data extraction into two parts. One is a chart entry and one is a BP entry. Uh, and at chart entry, we get all data that we think uh, that from previous encounters and things that will not change between chart open and BP entry. And then at the point uh, that we, that the nurse enters the blood pressure, we only get blood pressure and medications, a few vitals and medications. That way, that is very quick. Uh, so next slide. Uh, we just skip this, this one, and then let's skip this one and skip the next one too. Yeah, so um, I guess, like I said, um, this, the latency has a huge impact on user experience. Um, uh, though we have solved this at BP entry, I, I can imagine if somebody wants to refresh our wizard to get the latest labs, we are yet to find figure out how to make that fast. Um, and like I said, we ex split it into two points, but that may not always work. Um, we've tried to use data caching, like so whatever we extracted chart entry is cached. And then um, we use a lot of, we get a lot of data through the CDS hooks prefetch. So we don't have to go back into the chart and get more data. I guess uh, our the wish list is kind of our, um, also called, can be our challenges. It's just that we would, it would be great if we had, there were more uh, trigger points. And, you know, if you're familiar with FHIR, when we ask for a resource, it comes up with all the different code systems that we were hoping like, oh, and it makes the message very heavy. It's very large. So it would have been nice if we could specify a code system or specify more search parameters when we are asking, when we are looking for a resource. Um, and then another thing is to uh, be able to gather data across encounters. Um, and of course, search by base name and things like that. So, well, as we are implementing, we uh, we are learning a lot. So I, this has been challenging and it's very exciting that we will soon have our first, uh, you know, outside implementation with FHIR. Next slide. It's back to you, Patrick. Okay. So uh, we've had plenty of time to assess uh, the impact of these uh, tools, so this set of tools or evolving tool on these uh, different domains. Let, let's take another look at the next slide. This slide shows the use rates of the CDS at targeted visits. Now, uh, yeah, the denominator here 
is any visit made by a person 18 to 75 years old. And the numerator here is, uh, well, actually there's not, we fire at about 20% of all the visits based on CV risk as I talked about before. So the denominator here is the 20% of people that we're targeting. And the numerator is how many times do we have evidence that the CDS is used at that encounter. And the use rates uh, here are shown for about uh, uh, eight, or, eight, or nine, eight different uh, care delivery systems that are part of our overall system in Minnesota. And you can see that almost all these uh, clinics, this involves about 70 clinics, almost all these clinics are uh, in the 70 to 80% use rate. We think that 80% should be a maximum use rate because in primary care, based on chart audits and our own clinical experience, about one out of five times, the patient's either wheezing or weeping or vomiting or turning blue and you should be calling 911. So it's not at every visit that you want to be talking to them about cardiovascular risk factor management or glucose control. So these are very good use rates, and they've been sustained for the most part for, uh, for about 14 or 15 years. Next slide. Skip that slide. Next slide. <clears throat> We've also done surveys of primary care clinicians to see how they like Wizard, and most of them uh, like it a lot. 86% uh, of them think it's useful for shared decision making. 89% um, thought that ranking the clinical issues based on potential benefit, this is that prioritization function. 89% Eight, of the primary care clinicians think that's helpful. 64% um, think it influences what's addressed during a visit. And remember that primary care visits are usually not oriented towards cardiovascular risk factor control. Oftentimes, the patient's list of items includes things like a rash, a sore knee, the dog died, the granddaughter who's not married is pregnant, stuff like that. It takes your time and uses some of your um, visit. So that trying to get these extra things into the visit is tough. So if 64% of the time clinicians think it influences what gets addressed, that's a very, that's a very nice number. 60% uh, think it encourages patients to initiate conversations about these things because the clinician, the patient version gets handed to the patient by the rooming nurse and says, look, if you want to talk about these things, they might reduce your chance of a stroke or heart attack. Talk to your doctor if you're interested in any of those things. Uh, most of the docs said it does lengthen the appointment time if they use it, but they also say that it's time well spent. Uh, but the time thing is always a problem in primary care, and it is for this too, even though there's no clicks. It's used at both preventive visits and follow-up visits. And um, docs like, like it if we put it in the after-visit summary or if we could make it available in the, in the uh, EMR patient portal, which we're still working on that. Next slide. <clears throat> in an earlier survey, uh, clinicians, 98% thought it improved CV risk factor control. And in fact, the, the quantitative data under, you know, was consistent with that. 93% thought it saved time if you're focused on CV risk reduction or diabetes. 90% thought it efficiently elicited patient treatment preferences. This is important because you can say, are you interested in any of those things? When the patient says no, you say, oh, how about them Vikings? Or maybe if you're in New York, how about them Yankees? But the patient's gonna come back. So if the patient's not interested in any of these things, that's okay. You're going to get another shot at them. This thing's used continuously over time. And patients with these chronic conditions come into primary care a lot. Hypertension five times a year, diabetes eight times a year, uh, some of them a lot more. So uh, you, you wait for the patient to be ready. Uh, and the patient treatment preferences, uh, you know, they want to keep smoking. Okay, then they can see Maybe, the, maybe though they should consider something for their cholesterol. If the patient says, I want to keep smoking, but should I be doing something about my cholesterol? As a primary care clinician, that's heaven. Like if a patient says, should I be doing something about X, where X is something that improves their health, <laughs> like hypertension control or lipid control, you're in a very good position with that patient. That's a dream visit. Anyway, 95% thought it's useful for shared decision-making. 89% thought it influenced their treatment recommendations. 
94% uh, thought it helped initiate discussions of CV risk, and 85% of the clinicians reported their doctors like wizard. Next slide. Also, about 94% of the uh, clinicians would recommend it for use by their colleagues. We drilled down in terms of the clinical domains, and they like the clinical domains. The things on the bottom uh, four or five rows are things that weren't active in all the clinics, so the maximum response rate on, uh, from anticoagulant to medication adherence should have been 50% because only half of the clinicians had exposure to that. So docs uh, find it somewhat or very useful. And we think that the uh, advanced practice clinicians uh, rely on it quite a bit. Next slide. I'm going to skip this. It's a <clears throat> cross and error for patients that said, oh, yeah, I like this format. It'll certainly change my behaviors. And 63% of them said that, and I don't believe it. Next slide. Then we got three or four slides of publications. So I'm going to stop and we'll see if there's any questions. But before I stop, I'll just mention a couple of uh, future applications that um, <clears throat> that uh, the dot phrase use is a very valued feature of this thing by the docs. It's used uh, with as targeted visits and other visits. So you have like a dot CV risk, and it will blow in the conclusions from the decision support into either the after visit summary or into the note. So that's an extremely popular thing. We're eager to add additional clinical domains uh, to the decision support. And the things that we're interested in next are genetic syndromes. Uh, and there's only three CDC tier one genetic syndromes now. We're, we're trying to go after the cancer genetic syndromes. First, we wrote a grant on hyperlipidemia that we couldn't get funded. We'd like to have CHF um, and uh, <clears throat> COPD and asthma and depression. So that's uh, definitely on the uh, drawing board. And I think that the patient displays that you saw and the clinician displays. We only have one patient display, although we have it translated into Spanish. But uh, we're interested, and I think many people on the call might be interested in, how do you tailor the output from decision support systems to patients who have varying levels of numeracy and literacy, health literacy? So um, right now, our clinicians often give the clinician version to patients that are engineers, retired colonels, accountants, or nurses, or doctors, right? Because uh, the patient version is designed for lower literacy uh, use. So, but we're sort of one size fits all isn't, isn't so good. And I think that's an area where we all need to be focused on and, and uh, getting some improvement there. There's also some, you know, vast use of prediction equations. We use a lot of prediction equations in here, including the ACC, AHA, uh, pooled risk equations, including uh, the UK uh, PDS uh, diabetes outcome model two equation, including the old Framingham BMI risk equation, and some equations that have to do with CKD progression and OUD risk um, and cognitive impairment risk. So <clears throat> these risk equations are important and useful, but the FDA is uh, cracking down on that and evaluating it tightly. And, you know, um, there's clear evidence that doctors and patients don't like black box conclusions from, you know, very esoteric uh, math, you know, marginal structural modeling thing that no one understands says, okay, you do this. Nobody likes that. And the FDA doesn't like that. So there's this tension in current research between the potential to use AI and machine learning to develop woo-woo prediction equations for everything and the, what consumers want, both clinician and patient consumers, and what the FDA will allow. So that's a, a big area of interest right now. And then um, I should emphasize that this type of decision support uh, increases, uh, improves outcomes, but not not hugely, you know, the improvements are 5% more people under blood pressure control. Now, these are in mostly high functioning care systems. So 5% is nothing to sneeze at. You can get from 80 to 85% blood pressure control. That's pretty good. But uh, it's not the whole story. Decision support's not gonna get us to where everybody wants to go, but it's an important tool. It can carry some of the weight itself, but it's even better when it's combined with other things like registry approaches for active outreach, case management, 
uh, things that go direct to the patient outside the visit, et cetera. So I, I would close on that note by saying that these kind of CDS systems are best viewed not as the final word in care improvement, but as a very useful foundation that can be integrated with and power registry-based things, case management things, and keep everybody on the same care plan, the same evidence base, the same recommended meds in the, in the same sequences that are tailored to patient factors. Um, and I think I'll stop at that point, see if there's any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our speakers, um, Patrick, Deepa, Lydia, and Buck. And there were a couple questions asked during the presentation. One was for the MUSC um, project asking if um, CDS hooks is being used for the non-interruptive alert. Um, and Wei answered that they have a proxy midware um, between the CDS service and Epic Fire service server. And so um, if whomever asked that question, if you had any additional questions, um, feel free um, to follow up on that one. And then we also had a question about the Causary tool um, using um, PHQ-9 scores and if the tool will cover depression treatment. And um, the answer with that one was that there will be an alert on high PHQ-9 scores, but then leaves the treatment decisions to the provider. So again, if you had any additional questions related to that one, please feel free to enter those in the chat. And then I think I'm gonna start with a question that applies to all of the projects. And one was asking how you can handle different fire versions and how you do testing with your tools. So um, if someone, um, is ready to answer that question. Um, I see Lydia coming off mute. Yeah, I think for us, um, it might be a little different than the other apps, but um, when either the um, app is integrated, plugged into the EHR, then that can just get set up in a couple of lines of code to accept different versions of Fire or um, when uh, the when we um, implement as standalone, then that's not relevant because we're not getting inputs in that way. Um, and we try to keep ours up to date. Thanks, Lydia. Buck and, and Wei, do you have an answer for MUSC? That would be a way question. Okay. <laughs> um, Wait, do you have any thoughts? Um, sorry, I I um, I kept the answer in the uh, QA, uh, but we are using um, the Met data fair resource to handle different fair version. Okay, thanks for that answer, Way. And then um, Patrick and Deepa, um, are either of you able to provide how that's you'll handle deep, this? That's a Deepa thing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, right now we are using R4, uh, but uh, I imagine that when a new version comes out that we will have to do some, uh, ex and I think like Lydia said, when we configure our app within Epic, we can, uh, pick our fire versions. And then uh, I imagine that once uh, there will be a newer version that we would have to go back and do some testing, but we hope that it will all be backward compatible. Okay. Um, yes, I do hope that everything will be backward compatible. Um, and then someone just commented um, if there will be cases that the EMR is not on R4, like Cerner, um, that they're up to STU3 for an example. Yeah, I imagine that when we implement with another uh, EMR like Cerner, you know, that's when we have to kind of, since the data that we want is, um, 
really a subset of what's in there. I think when we get to that point, we have to do some testing and see if, or how we would handle that. Okay, thank you, Deepa. I would, I would add one thing to that, that, you know, as a non uh, programmer type person, it appears that uh, fire data sets um, are narrower than the than what we have access to now, so that we're entertaining the possibility that we might need to dumb down our algorithms a little bit if we can't get all the data points that we want. Uh, that that would require some changes, perhaps, in our uh, algorithms, which would also then require some changes in how we suggest things. I should say that the output that goes to the clinicians is very softly worded. It's consider this consider that we never ever use the word should we never have a hard stop um, but um, you know we're sort of wrestling around with we have very detailed outlet output right now <clears throat> and if we're constrained in terms of data inputs for informatics reasons as we go along at least in the early stages of fire um, we might have to water down our algorithms a little bit Okay, and then I actually had um, one more question about the priority wizard tool. And I was wondering if you um, were using one of the hooks from CDS hooks that already exists like patient view, or if you created your own um, for the for your CDS tool. Oh, oh so do you mean, uh, do you mean, a in terms of where it can get triggered. Yeah, yeah, like if you're okay, using yeah. patient view or order sign or order select, or if you yeah, made I a think, new one. Actually, I think Epic uh, provides more than what this, uh, you know, the CDS hooks, uh, what's available to regular CDS hooks. So for example, the vitals entry is something that Epic provides that's not in the standard specification. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and now we have another question um, asking which open source CDS hooks framework did you start with, if any, for the community to build on? So I think that's probably um, for Deepa as well, and then maybe um, Buck and Wei could answer that after. Sure. Uh, we did not use anything, uh, any open source framework, except that, you know, we use that uh, for the for fire, we use that HAPI, I think that they have all, all of that implemented, all the fire resources implemented, like in Java. So we use that one, but for CDS hooks itself, I don't think we used anything. Okay. And if there you. are other programmers from, uh, you know, my team, they can feel free to answer too. And um, Buck or Way, um, did you want to talk a little bit more about um, the CDS hooks framework for your project? Um, hey, I'm Way. Um, we also using uh, we are using the uh, API uh, from uh, Smart CDR uh, as our um, open source platform to um, to develop the CDS hooks related projects. Uh, we also using the uh, RBM fair open source projects as well for especially for bulk APIs uh, to get more fair resources in the same time. Um, especially for deep learning, machine learning related projects to streaming the uh, fair data to um, training module. Okay, thanks, Wei. Um, right now it's looking like we've answered all of the questions in the chat. Um, so, we do have some more time, so please feel free to add any other questions you have. Um, and one of the things that 
I was thinking about um, between um, these example tools and um, the earlier presentation by Dr. Russell was how um, you know he was talking about um, prioritizing um, points of care during visits and also automating checklists. And I was thinking about how both of those seemed to fit with our examples today that with the priority wizard tool, you know, it, um, for like the, both the provider and patient facing side, you know, it is prioritizing um, some points that can be um, important to improving their care. And that while guidelines, um, which are used in both of the opioid prescribing um, tools, aren't necessarily a checklist, I can think about it in the same way as like a checklist. And so that, you know, they're having um, the guideline built into the tool, um, to help them stick to what's in the guideline. And I was hoping that we could have Dr. Russell um, speak on this a little bit, but it looks like he's had to drop off of the presentation. Um, but if you know anybody else here had comments about that, um, please feel free to add those to the chat. And then um, we did get one more question. Now, um, what do the presenters think of developing um, AI and machine learning enabled diagnostic um, prediction CDS. What are some of the challenges? And um, maybe that would be a good question for Deepa. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Actually, uh, in our CDS, we have um, integrated two machine learning models. One is for cognitive impairment, and the other is for uh, predicting. Um, OUD, uh, oh no, suicide risk, I think. Yes, so um, what we found really challenging is some of these models, especially if they've de been developed like, you know, in isolation, the amount of data that they require is uh, a lot. And, you know, to do that in a real time CDS, it means that we have to extract a lot of data. So for example, for cognitive impairment, what we had to do is, uh, uh, whittle down the variables that were going to be fed into the model and again, reevaluate the model and then implement it. Uh, apart from that, of course, there is, uh, I think Patrick talked about, you know, how physicians don't like a black box with a prediction coming out. So if we can't explain it, you know, they don't trust it as much. But in terms of technology, at least, uh, we have found that some of these models we have to implement as a batch process and integrate that into the CDS instead of being able to run it real time because of the amount of data that they need. And Allison, just to jump in and add to that, because I um, have done a lot of work in this area, both with um, the sort of um, folks who develop the AI models, as well as folks who've had these models. And, you know, there are, there's a whole number of challenges, I think, you know, already highlighted, but other challenges about safety and, and other issues. And I think one thing to consider, I um, worked with a really effective model when I was at the University of Cambridge, but this came out of the University of um, Iowa. And, um, they have a surgical site prediction tool there where they're reducing 90% of their surgical site infections by using the tool. It cannot harm the patient. And I think this is really key. It just picks who is at higher risk of surgical site infection. And then there are additional interventions, non-harmful interventions. If you aren't at risk that you can do to the patient to prevent surgical site infection, it is not a very good model. It, it, its prediction rate is fairly low, but what it is doing is picking all the right people and you get a handful of um, people who aren't going to be at high risk for surgical site infection, but they're still um, decreasing their costs um, extensively and preventing a lot of um, uh, harm to the patient. So I think, you know, I think when we think about these tools, we think about how perfect and how accurate they are. And I think we should probably start our focus on what tools can we use that would create a big um, support for care, reduction in patient suffering, reduction in 
cost without being able to harm the patient. And then they don't need to be that accurate. So I think that's just something I like everybody to keep in mind. I am so impressed with this tool. And, um, you know, like I said, it's probably one of the four um, machine learning models I've seen in terms of its ability to predict, but it's doing so much for the service. Um, I think, you know, there are lots of other challenges um, as Jeepa mentioned in getting data and processing data. Um, and then of course, when you want to implement the tool at another site, you're gonna need to um, run it again on the data at that site because patients are very different by different um, healthcare facilities. So, you know, just, just things to remember, but I think we just don't wanna to ask too much of the tools. And then I think providers can trust them. Well, I would like to uh, add to that. I agree with that in general. And um, like in primary care, whenever you're looking at a diagnostic thing, like something that estimates suicidality risk or OUD risk or um, uh, cognitive impairment risk, um, you can design the, you get a score and you can set the threshold for who to identify anywhere you want. And you can pick thresholds that uh, get you high sensitivity so that you'll find almost all the cases. But the cost of that is invariably, uh, you'll identify lots of people that don't really have it. Or you can, alternatively, you could set a threshold that if you identify the patient, there's a very high likelihood, 80 or 90%, that they have the condition that you're after. In that case, you're gonna miss at least half the cases is a general rule, right? Now in primary care, for things that are not like meningitis, where you know have a matter of hours makes a huge difference, but you know, chronic disease care and primary care, uh, my own bias, you know, you have to discuss it each time, each condition, but my bias is that you go for high positive predictive value because if you start to identify all kinds of people, for example, is potential opioid use disorder patients, and only one out of five actually has it. Primary care docs are going to stop using that after a couple of visits because they're going to say, the last few times I used this, it didn't get me anywhere. I just wasted a lot of time. Heck with it. Bye. I'm not going to use that anymore. But if you have high predictive value, you'll get uh, cases, usually the most uh, mm, uh, notable cases. And in primary care, patients come back. So the patients have, you know, the average American has four visits a year, and these people with chronic conditions have more than that, as I mentioned before. So you have many more shots at them. So it, in my experience, it's much better in primary care land for chronic disease to set the thresholds for prediction equations high. And uh, so that most of the people you tag will have the condition. So primary care docs and clin clinicians will say, okay, great, that was helpful. If you set it, so that sensitivity is high, you're going to get them stopping using the tool. Um, that's, that's different for inpatient stuff. Like when you want to predict sepsis, you want to get all the cases, right? But EPIC's uh, sepsis predictor is one of, probably one of the reasons why FDA is so aggressive right now, because it was shown to miss cases and kill patients, right? So it was an example of a prediction equation that didn't work very well. Um, so anyway, this positive predictive value of sensitivity thing needs to be carefully thought out uh, for each condition and for different care scene settings like emergency rooms, primary care, and inpatient. I would definitely support that and, and also remind people that, you know, one of our um, most important epidemiological strategies, especially for um, primary care and identifying chronic conditions is... Um, you know, uh, test, testing twice, right? Testing with something that is um, uh, more specific and then something that's more sensitive. And we can use decision support the same way and we can use um, uh, AI and machine learning the same way. So don't forget that we can do a two-layer testing to um, actually grab people who are more likely to have the um, condition and then be more sensitive and pick them out from that group. Yep. 
Great. Thanks for those comments. And we got a couple more questions. Another one AI related and from Colleen, um, who asks, does anyone see LLM based medical chatbots, AI assistants, et cetera, as providing another paradigm for non-interruptive alert development and interruption with a possible chief benefit to providers for reducing burnout? Do any of you have any comments on that? What if you unmuted that person and got them to say more? Colleen, if you are um, inter interested in being unmuted, um, we can do that. Actually, this is this is not Colleen. I'm I'm signed in with Colleen's account. I think Colleen's on the call oh, okay. too. But my name's Andrew, and um, yeah, so I'm with a company, and we're looking at a company that provides uh, referential clinical decision support. Um, and we're looking, and we've been trying to also develop uh, CDS using the CDS hooks paradigm, and and just uh, working with Epic a lot, and. It's just been fraught with all kinds of problems. Um, and so, so we're starting to really think that uh, um, chat GT, GPT and uh, other large language models might provide an avenue for guiding clinicians that's non-interruptive and, and it's more of a narrative approach, an assistant approach. And I'm just wondering if this is gonna, if anyone feels this is gonna be a paradigm shift in clinical decision support where, rules maintenance um, and the difficulty of the knowledge base ever shifting could be handled by AI rather than us trying to build uh, knowledge management systems that are very complex. That's my, that anyway, maybe it's not a question, but just an idea. I, I think, you know, Watson kind of went belly up, right? So Watson was like a knowledge management system that was supposed to be the next big, big thing. IBM invested in it hugely. They used yeah. it as own Kettering. It went belly right. up. I'm not sure that GPT is going to do better than Watson. But, you know, I live in hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that for chronic disease care, for common chronic conditions, we're not talking about diagnosis. We're talking about management. Um, it's not rocket science. I mean, the the guidelines are out there. The methods are out there. Uh, it's not super complicated. I mean, um, and you know, I know I don't want twenty references when I'm seeing a patient. You know, I, I have some very specific thing I have in mind if I need help. Good point. So yeah. no, I don't know. I I hope that uh, somebody thinks of something better than what we've got. Maybe it's you. Well, I don't know. I wonder what other people think. I would just jump in to say that, you know, I think there's a lot of um, utility with tools like chat GPT that are coming up, but I want to remind everyone about bias and AI and um, your training set creates bias and there is significant bias there. So, you know, that would be my caution. And especially with the U.S. Healthcare Service, where we know that there is bias in who's getting treatment and who's getting more frequent treatment, mm -hmm. um, that we just want to be highly mindful of that while we um, uh, use these tools. So, you know, part of it is about the tool and what's available in the machine learning. And part of it is really understanding um, like the discussion we were having previously about multiple testing and when you want high sensitivity and when you want high specificity and when you want high predictive um, value. So I think, you know, these are very important thought processes and what bias will create. Um, what we don't ever want to do is end up treating the population that gets the most treatment and excluding the rest of the population. So I think that is a really, really important um, thing to keep in mind when we think about using these tools. You know, but another thought is that, you know, when we want to customize the output of a CBS system, I mentioned before that we'd like to tailor it to patients. 
I know that ChatGBT can take a message and give you 10 different versions of it, right? Um, funny man did that. He was pretty impressed and he's a pretty skeptical person. So, you know, what if the output could be tailored using uh, chat GPT or something like that to patients with different characteristics? That would be very, very cool. I mean, uh, or use it to tailor recommendations based on cultural preferences, like nutritional recommendations for diabetes patients. If the patient indicated some of their uh, eating preferences, chat GPT maybe could take that into account and translate the principles into specifics from that patient's world, that might be very cool. So, you know, I, I'm sure that this stuff will come in handy, but, um, you know, uh, there's so many different ways it can be applied. It will be interesting to see how it unfolds. Yeah, this is Deepa. I just want to say, uh, you know, in not in terms of point of care, but I just imagine that these uh, might be very useful in helping a uh, patient maintain uh, between visits, right? So here, uh, the doctor says, take these medications, do this and all of that. And you could use GPT to coach them between visits to make sure that they're following whatever uh, protocol that they were asked to. Oh, that's a great, those are great ideas. Really good, thank you. All right, thanks for asking that question. And then we got one more question about the adaptability of CDS in dental clinics. And I don't know if any of our, uh, if our speakers have any experience with dental. So. We do. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> we have a dental wizard that we forgot to talk about today. But uh, Deepa, you've been pretty in the middle of that, haven't you? Yeah, I can uh, briefly talk yeah, about, about it. So that. for dental, uh, we implemented the same CDS for dental. In that case, we I think we uh, looked at three domains. One is opioid prescribing, one is HPV, and one is tobacco use. And so uh, technology-wise, the implementation is the same. And uh, we were also looking at moving that to fire, which would actually have much greater impact because dental... Um, you know, EDRs are very, uh, some some people have very tiny EDRs and, you know, it's just much easier to have a fire implementation than our standard EPIC code implementation. But yes, uh, this same thing would work in dental cl clinics and we've done that a lot. So we're very keen to um, be able to offer causery to dental clinics because oftentimes, the sort of duplication and prescribing of opioids we see is that, you know, dentists don't have as um, often may not have as good of access to PDMP and, um, you know, making that easier would be terrific. Um, but uh, reaching our dental colleagues is a little bit more of a challenge. So we would love um, input from you on um, the best way to reach dental colleagues and, and let them know that's available. And actually, um, you know, the standalone system really, I think, supports that for the dental clinics if they don't have sort of a EHR that is um, has easy integration with smart on fire application. So whoever asked the question, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, if you can let us know who asked that question, um, we could have you unmuted, or if you just want to send me an email and we can forward your comments on my emails here on this slide. Um, and I guess we are pretty close to three o'clock right now, and um, I wanted to thank all of our speakers for such a great uh, session today. And I know I learned a lot about new tools and I hope our audience did as well. And um, as a reminder, you can look forward to our second and third sessions in September and November, and you'll be able to find registration links in our um, Tuesday emails that come out from ONC and um, on our website. And then we will have our um, slides posted 
and the recording posted on our website um, within a few weeks. So you can check there um, for any parts of the presentation that you may have missed or wanted to rewatch. So um, thanks again for everyone. And we hope that you enjoyed today's session and we look forward to seeing you at our um, second session in September. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much. Thank Great you. Discussion. Yeah. Thank you.